Okay, welcome to our Wednesday afternoon Bible class. It is January 20th. We are picking up in our study of what happens on God's timeline from the tribulation all the way to eternity future. We are to the point that we are talking about Israel being regathered, but a question came up about Babylon being the Antichrist headquarters and then a change being made. So in a very succinct, without going into the long study of chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation, of Revelation, let me just say that Revelation 18 is showing the government, the economic center for the world. Uh, it, all the world's attention is on the Antichrist lead, and we see that coming from Babylon. Now, Babylon in Scripture is said that it would be destroyed, and people say, well, Babylon's been destroyed. It's never been destroyed the way described in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, where it will be destroyed by fire, where it will be destroyed so that there's no stones left, that they're not reused in rebuilding or anything else. It's an utter destruction. What we read in Revelation 18 mirrors that destruction that we read about in Yermia. I believe that to be future. Remember, our book of Revelation is very orderly, and chapters 17 and 18 are during the tribulation time. They're, they're on the heels by the time we get to 19. We have the end of the tribulation, the return of the Lord to, to, uh, um, to set up his kingdom for the millennial reign. We're right in that time period in our normal setting right now. But before the tribulation ends, and I believe it's going to be in that second half of the tribulation and probably closer to the end of it than, than even the very beginning of the second half, we see this utter collapse of Babylon that has all this economic, uh, the, the merchants of the world, their ships are coming through, uh, every bit of commerce, of trade, everything has been centered here. The kings of the earth are going to stand afar off, watch Babylon burn and bewail it, according to Revelation 18. Now in 17, you see the woman destroyed. The woman is called Mystery Babylon. That's referring to the religious system. 17 gives you a religious view. 18 gives you economic, governmental, commerce view. In 17, the woman is destroyed by 10 kings. They choose to plunder her. They choose to loot her. And the one heading that all up is the Antichrist who has used her. And now he's going to usurp her because he's going to take her wealth to himself. And he's going to set himself up as that God to be worshipped through the world. So he has to get rid of any other religious system. It has to be he and he only. And we know he does it at that midpoint. So somewhere, I would say right about the midpoint, we see that religious collapse. And then in that second half, we see chapter 18, the destruction, where the kings are not happy about it. They're not the cause of it. In fact, it talks about an earthquake that causes the destruction. I believe that could be literal. And we do see the effects from earthquakes sometimes are fires that are begun. And I do believe that it is going to burn. I believe that, that Babylon being rebuilt now, having used stones from Nebuchadnezzar's time, we know Saddam Hussein did a lot to rebuild. We know they have palatial palaces. None of that will be true in the future of Babylon. Once it's been destroyed, like uh, we're reading in chapter 18, and in connection with Jeremiah, that's going to be it, because God said it would never be built again. So I believe that's coming. Now, the Antichrist, wanting to head all commerce, wanting to be the seat of government, has set himself up a palatial palace, I'm sure, in Babylon, I believe. I believe that that's his headquarters there because that's where everything's coming and going through the seas and, and all of that that is there at that time. When that's destroyed, Antichrist has a problem now. His government, his seat, his office, his palace is, is in shreds. It's destroyed. He's got to do something. What's the most likely scenario that I could see would be, well, he's got this right-hand man. We call him the false prophet. They've been working in tandem. They've been working con in conjunction to help each other. We see that, that the false prophet has caused much of the world to bow down and worship the beast. So he's not trying to come against the beast. He's trying to be a teammate with him. The false prophet being Jewish very likely has his headquarters in Jerusalem. Very likely is working in the Jewish communities there because he's getting or he was getting the Jews to follow until those who are believers realize and will not bow down to the beast. 
But if you've had your place destroyed and your right-hand man has his place, it's easy to say, well, wouldn't the Antichrist come over and get together in the headquarters of the false prophet? Well, if I'm right, then that's the full understanding of Daniel 11.45. I'm going to look that up real quick. You don't have to, but it mark down for yourself to read Daniel 11.40 to 45 later for it to all make sense but because again i'm not doing the full study just the the end and i should never give you a time because i always talk longer than i think but verse 45 says finally when he and it's referring to the antichrist when he pitches the tents of his palace when he sets up his palace where in daniel 11 45 it says between the seas and the mountain of the holy glory Okay, the mountain of the holy glory has to be Jerusalem. The, the mountains of Jerusalem has to be. It, are there seas? Oh, easily. There's the Mediterranean Sea on the west. There's a Red Sea below to the south. There's the Dead Sea. If you want to go into inland, there's the Sea of Galilee. And Jerusalem is between those. If you want literally east to west, you've got between Galilee and the Dead Sea, and you've got the Mediterranean. You don't even have to bring in the Red Sea. So it fits that between the seas in the Holy Mountain would be a description for Jerusalem. That It says that, that he's pitched his tents there, he's made his palace there, but notice what happens there. He will come to his end with no one to help him. This is where why I think it's very close to the end of the tribulation because he goes over there, he's weakened now. His whole economy has imploded on him. At this point, those who have not been happy with him being dictator and him getting everything and all being about him, they're going to think this is the time to attack. This is the time to go after him while he's weakened. Before he can get himself established or get a foothold in Israel, they're going to want to dive in for their portion, especially also because Israel will have booty, will have things that they want to plunder. We know that from all along through Scripture we see that, that they want to come into Israel to take a spoil. So the countries are going to come down. They're going to say, whoa, wait a minute, we are not going to let the Antichrist get a foothold here and run the entire world from this location. This is our time to rise up. So Russia is going to come down for her good. Egypt's going to come up for its good. Red China is coming over for their reasons. And the Eastern Bloc, or the Western Bloc, whatever we are, the EU, this area, will be coming across at the same time too. But that's when we know it turns out to be the Battle of Armageddon. It's the battle to the, the death of who is going to be on top now. We know there's no honor among thieves. Those who have even shown allegiance to the Antichrist may be thinking, hey, I don't like the way I've been treated. I don't like that, that it's not been good for me. I don't like that my country is suffering. I'm going to get my portion. I'll show the Antichrist I've got something of value here too. So you've got everyone coming for different reasons and same reasons. And it's at this point that we see the Lord come out of heaven, Revelation 19. Stop the battle of Armageddon. Put it to an end. All the enemies who've come up against Israel to take a spoil from her and the Millennial Kingdom, chapter 20, is set up. So, this fits right into our lesson for today because we're going back into that time. Um, did I give you everything I think uh, that I did? Um, by the way, to the beginning of chapter 18, sounds like it continues following the events of 17. So the religious destruction comes first at that midpoint. We know that one because we know that's when he pulls all religious... Um, um, allegiance to himself and then the 18 would follow that's just another little proof for the timing on on that um, revelation describes babylon east of jerusalem mesopotamia is east of jerusalem in biblical times babylon iraq is in mesopotamia so if you see these other names that that's how it all relates um, and i think that does cover it well so We've had the collapse, we've had the stop of the Battle of Armageddon, we've had the Lord return, annihilate with the sword out of his mouth the enemies of Israel, cast the Antichrist and the false prophet into hell, into the lake of fire. We see that, and we'll see it again shortly when the, our millennial study ends. And we have the time that we got into last week of the setting up of the millennial kingdom.
to set up that millennial kingdom. God is going to bring certain people into his kingdom, and that's what we've been talking about. Israel as a whole will be regathered, that God is not done with the nation of Israel. His plans to Israel are going to be fulfilled in detail. We saw last week from Matthew 24, 31, that he was going to gather the Jewish people from the, the four ends of the earth, that they would be gathered by the angels. We saw in, in uh, Zechariah that there would be a fountain opened up for the cleansing of the people. This is showing that the ones who are coming in are believing in the shed blood and the word of God for their salvation. That's Zechariah 12. Um, somewhere we, we talked about, oh, being brought back by the people. I missed that also. Besides the angels bringing them back, people would bring them back. It talked about them riding on their shoulders and, and helping them in their carts and all kinds of ways they would help bring them back. We saw that by the prophet Isaiah. Then we looked in Romans and we saw Romans speaks to a national restoration of Israel in chapter 11. We know that Israel was a nation reborn in a day, that she was reinstated as a state, that she became a nation again. I say these words carefully because Israel never ceased to exist, but she wasn't back in her land for almost 2,000 years. That in itself is a miracle because the people out of their land for that long cease. They don't remain a people. I ask you today, where's the Hittites? How about the Girgashites? Have you seen an Amalekite? Have you shook hands with a Philistine? These are enemies that God allowed a full end to come to. But he's never allowed a full end of the Jew, and he never allowed a full end of Israel. Has Israel been trampled underfoot? Yes. Are, have we seen the worst? No. The worst is yet to come during the tribulation time. Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot. It says for 42 months, for the second half of the tribulation, it's trodden underfoot. We know that Zechariah tells us two-thirds of Israel is going to be destroyed during this time. That, that basically two out of three Jewish people will lose their lives during this time. Now that doesn't mean that they're all unsaved because we know a great number come to faith by the 144,000, by the two witnesses, and by the people saved from them who will go on and be a witness. So it tells us that many are beheaded for their faith, for keeping the testimony of Yeshua and for the, keeping the commandments of God. I see in that two groups of people. I see the Jewish people who are intent on being obedient to God, and I see those who we call Christians. I believe that, that the Jewish people that are coming in are coming to saving faith, coming to understand. And so, as horrible as it is, better they lose their life in the tribulation due to persecution of their faith in Yeshua Jesus than that they die unsaved. Uh, it's a horrible way that they've had to suffer in the end and go through all the horrors of this world during that time. But at least if they get saved, they, hallelujah, they get saved. They get plucked out of that Holocaust and they get an eternity with the Lord. So um, I'm not telling you two-thirds of Israel doesn't make it to heaven, but I'm telling you two-thirds of the, the, the nation will be destroyed during the tribulation. Other nations will also be devastated because this is a worldwide catastrophe tra yes, tribulation yeah i don't know i watch the words they say because this is the wrath of god being poured out on a world that is full of sin a world that deserves its judgment by the hand of the one who created it this world that has chosen not to follow god and that really is israel's problem also Yes, God has brought her back into the land, but she is Ezekiel 37. She's in the land with no spirit in her. She doesn't have the spirit of God in her. She's not as a whole. There are individuals, but as a whole, the nation is not listening to their God. That's why God is going to allow tribulations to come on them to help wake them up the same way when they were in Egypt and the slave, the taskmasters came over them so that they would be in need because Honestly, most people won't look to God until they're hurting. But when they're hurting, then they get the, their heads back on right and realize, wow, maybe we need to pay attention to God and be obedient to his plan. So the tribulation is to awaken Israel and bring her into her blessings, bring her into the promises God has made for her, which is the promise of millennial reign. He has promised Israel to be the head nation. He has not said that to the exclusion of the, the rest of the world being cared for. On the contrary, 
the rest of the world as they come up to Israel, come up to the, the temple, come up to worship, come up to bring their offerings to the Lord, will take blessings back to their land also. God is not in favor of the Jew and not the Gentile. God is in favor of his children being obedient to him that he might bless them. We're even told now, you don't have blessing now because you're not right with me or you haven't asked of me and then put it into my hands and allowed me. We need to even take that to heart today because we tend to get caught up and I know it's discouraging days. We get caught up in a pandemic, we get isolated, we get discouraged, we get depressed. God is still on his throne. He's not forsaken and he's not forgotten and nothing's knocked him off. He doesn't come up with plan B. This is his plan. He is working something far greater than we realize. Don't lose sight of your God. Don't lose sight of your faith. This is where if it's really true, use it and you'll find where the rubber meets the road, there is your Savior. There is your hope, there is your strength, there is your answer. He will bring us through the storm. And he says, if it even does take your life, don't fear what man can do to you. Man can take your life from you. Fear the one whose soul your hands are in. Because even if you lose your earthly life in COVID or something else, your soul is set free with the Lord in heaven if you are his. Nothing can separate you from the love of your Lord. And in that we can say a hallelujah. So the one that we prayed for at the start of this class, who is a pastor, who has been faithful to his Lord, this is not a consequence on him in judgment, but he is, and I don't want to say victim, but he is experiencing the effects of sin in this world. And if he does not pull through physically on earth, he's going to be set free from a body that is dying, that is weak, that does hurt and, and needs fixing all the time, don't we? It'll be all glory for him. We selfishly want to hold on to our loved ones, and I get that. And we pray if this isn't his time to go home, that the Lord research him, give him physical strength again. But whichever way it goes, God didn't forsake him. God didn't, oh, I didn't see that pastor. Oops, I forgot. No, and God didn't put a judgment on him and say, you deserve this consequence. Remember, our God is not a God up there with a bully club looking when he can whomp you on the head because you didn't do it right. He's looking for a heart that is in conjunction with him to work through. And as we go through these difficult times, I could ask everybody in this room who has a walk with the Lord, when did you really grow in your walk? And everybody's going to tell me, in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, in the hard spot, in the time when everything looked like God had forgotten me, my God was faithful, and that's where I grew. And that's why you can even say, thank you, Lord, for a pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for a situation that's not to my liking, a leader that may not be to my liking, losing a job, having to be isolated, whatever. I see God have victory always. Are we still connected? Yes. Did this pandemic happen a hundred years ago? No. Did it happen when Zoom was available? And as good or bad as it is, I thank the Lord for it because we're still here. Back on track. We've got um, the nation being restored now. She has come through that tribulation time. God is bringing her back from the four corners of the earth supernaturally. She's coming back via the people that he's using. The nation that was born in a day is the nation that the Lord is returning to, setting up his literal kingdom on earth from. This is literal. I don't know how I can stress that more. But it so grieves my spirit to even have heard today it spoken where there is one who is saying, well, I don't know that that's literal. I don't know that we can take it that way. <sighs> take it to the bank if God says it. And if Revelation 20 tells you six times in 13, 14 verses that there's going to be a thousand year reign of Yeshua Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, take it literally. If he says it once, take it literally. 
We only use, look for the symbolic when we don't understand in a literal sense. Then we realize, okay, there's more going on. And are there many levels? Yes. And when the Lord is sitting on his throne on earth, is he also sitting on his throne in heaven? Yes. Well, wait a minute. How can the Lord do that? Hello? Is he confined? Mm -hmm. Is he less than the world he created? Is he less than the university? The university? <laughs> <laughs> universes that he's created is he unable to do anything he wants our god is an awesome god he reigns from heaven his rule will come down on earth in the same way it is in heaven we will come back and rule and reign with him we are not part of those coming into the millennium we are talking about those who have lived through the tribulation so back to them Let's read Yeshaya, Isaiah 27. We're going to look at verses 12 and 13. Yeshaya. Yes. You think too, if God can hear all our prayers, I think that's one person, individually. The Roger is saying, yeah, if God can hear all our prayers at the same moment and hear them individually, then how can he not be easily on a throne in heaven and on a throne in, on earth at the same time? Don't limit your God. If you can't figure it out, it's because you're trying to put God on your human level. And I, for one, thank God he's not on my level. I didn't create this God. I'm not that creative. And even if I could create something, it could never be on the magnitude of our God. And yes, I'll point out those prayers also are not all in English. They're in every language. They're coming in all directions. Our God is Awesome. Amazing. Do you ever feel like he's saying, oh, wait a minute, I'm listening to so-and-so? <laughs> we don't hear that, do we? We know in an instant the Lord is hearing us, interacting with us through prayer. The original what? supercomputer. Yes, the original supercomputer. And I've often thought that man comes up with a computer. Well, who came up with man's computer in his mind? Who came up with man? Who came up with a supercomputer that's beyond, that will blow our computers out of this water? We think they're so great. Wait till you see God's. <laughs> and believe me, he's not sitting behind a desk going <laughs> <laughs> but you get my point Isaiah 27 verse 12 on that day the Lord will thresh from the flowing stream of the Euphrates river to the brook of Egypt, thresh means to beat out, it's speaking of harvesting when you're threshing you are getting to the point of gathering in your harvest and he's saying it's going to come from all directions, all the way over from the Euphrates River, that's Babylon area, that's Iraq, that's Mesopotamia area, to the brook of Egypt, that could be the Nile. It's definitely talking about Egypt. And it says, and you, and he's speaking to Israel, and the rest of the verse will make it clear, you will be gathered up one by one, you sons of Israel. One by one. Oh, God's going to see that little Persian Jew that, remember, he did that once before. Her name was Esther. She lived in a Persian empire. How does a little Jewish girl in a Persian empire, 127 provinces, the, the territory went all the way into India. How does a little Jewish girl get raised up and sit on the throne as queen? That was amazing. Yes, God's going to see that Jew sitting on the bank of the Euphrates and bring him home. Yes, God's going to see the little Jew in San Bernardino and bring them home. From wherever they are, there's going to be this great gathering one by one. All who belong to Israel, all who are Jewish, are going to be brought in because this is the time that God has promised to redeem and bring back the nation of Israel. People-wise is what I'm saying. I'm not talking, they already have salvation. I'm not talking personal salvation. I'm talking now the physical salvation, the geographic location. Look at chapter 43 of Isaiah. We'll look at that geographic location. Okay, Isaiah 43, we're going to go to verses 5 and 6. Did I forget to read 13? I think I forgot to read 13. Keep going to 45. I'm going to read you 13 because I have it in my notes. Yes. It will come about also on that day that a great trumpet will be blown. I guarantee you that's a shofar. Whether it's an animal shofar or a silver shofar, it's a shofar. Those who were perishing in the land of Assyria, who were scattered in the land of Egypt, will come and will worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. That tells you when it's going to be. When he's in Jerusalem, has the, the millennial temple, 
and they're coming up to worship the Lord. Now go with me to Isaiah 40, 43, sorry, verses 5 and 6. And here we read, Do not fear, Israel, wake up. And can we apply this to ourselves? Absolutely, we can apply it. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring. That means your children. That means your grandchildren. That means that, that those who were in tune with their God, who were looking at great greats, it's their great great grandchildren. He will gather you, the bring your offspring from the east, China, red China, India. He will bring the offspring. He will gather them from the west. I guess if you go far enough west, we can call it the United States. <laughs> uh, I will say to the north, north of Israel is Russia. Give them up. Bring them home. I will say to the south, do not hold them back. Egypt and the, the country surrounding Egypt, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar. Bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. All are being called in. I look at Operation Moses that's brought the Ethiopian Jewish people home. And they thought they brought them all home. And now they realize there's still more. And they're doing all they can. They think very soon they will have every Ethiopian Jew out of that land and back in Israel. And these are people that are going from having never seen electricity, indoor plumbing. All the, they're being brought into, oh my goodness, they must think it's like, going to have it <laughs> once they get used to it but they're being brought in who's put that on their heart god has put it on their heart they're bringing them in for the safety because the only safe place that the, the jewish person could be guaranteed safety they believe is in the land of israel but i see a uh, prefiguring of what the lord will do when he says i'm going to bring you all back i'm going to bring you all home there's an interesting Ha, ah, what's the word I want? Well, I'm trying to think of the word, go to Jeremiah 31. I'll tell you where in a moment, but go to Yermia chapter 31. There's an interesting, <coughs> I'll call it phenomena going on. You can talk to Jewish people worldwide, and you can find among them, and I'm not saying every single one has this, but you can find among a good majority of them a tug to go back home to Israel. We call it home, although we never lived there as a home. I told people when I got to go for the first time, I was 16, I told everybody I could corner, I get to go home, I get to go home, and I really <clears throat> meant that. Do I feel at home in Israel? If my roommate from my last trip could attest to the fact she said she saw how at home I was, that I just belong there, that it's in my very fiber, my very being. How does that happen? Do you hear every Italian say, I've got to get to Italy? Do you hear every Korean say, I've got to live in Korea? You don't hear that, but the Lord seems to be putting a tad on the Jewish hearts. He's got a call for them. He's calling them home, and he'll fulfill it greatly himself because most, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot won't make it home until he supernaturally enables them to at this time. In Jeremiah 31, verses 8 through 10, it says, Behold, Hello, are you awake? Did you hear our word? Behold, remember God wants your attention. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country. I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. Among them, those who are blind, those who are at limp, the pregnant woman and she who's in labor together, they will return here as a great assembly. He's calling them all, not the Wonderful. Remember when Daniel, Daniel went into captivity? It was three uh, waves of those taken into captivity. And the first wave, Daniel went. Why did Daniel go then? Because he was young. He was vibrant. He was muscular. He was of a good mind. They were picking the cream of the crop. By the time they got down to the third wave, they were taking a lot that didn't have as much to offer Babylon as the first wave. And the only ones they left behind were the weak and the sickly and the elderly, the ones who could be of no value to, the, to Babylon and could do no harm to them, leaving them behind. The Lord's not picking the best. He's picking them all. They can be blind. They can be lame. They can be, it's going to be hard to bring a pregnant woman. We know that. We know what it's like when we're pregnant. It's harder to get around. But he's returning them a great assembly, a great gathering together. Verse 9, they will come with weeping. Their hearts are, are just 
broken for their Lord. They're coming home. They're coming to worship Messiah. They're coming to their very king. That by pleading, I will bring them. I will lead them by streams of water. They're going to need water for sustenance. God's saying, I'll provide what they need on a straight path on which they will not stumble. They're not going to get tripped up anymore. They're not going to get cast out. They're not going to fall down and not be able to make it. I'm going to bring them all home because I am a father to Israel. Ephraim, one of uh, the, the tribe's names, Ephraim, is my firstborn. Israel is who he puts first, and then he blesses the rest of the world through him. He's going to fulfill the promise he made all the way back to Avraham, that through Avraham's seed, which we know is Yeshua, born of Jewish descent in the physical, through this seed, the rest of the world would be blessed. That when you bless them, you'll be blessed. When you curse them, the cursing would come. But here we see the blessing. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Declare it in the coastlands far away and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him. And he will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. I love this verse. Yes, God allowed the scattering of Israel. We are scattered to the four corners of this earth. I don't care where you go, you can find a Jew there. <laughs> they're, they're mixed into every race. They've settled down. They've been scattered. James writes to the diaspora, the Jews scattered abroad. They are still scattered. But God scattered them because of disobedience, because they would not, uh, would not look to him as their Messiah, as their Savior, and as their King. So he allowed them to go into captivity of, a diff of one sort or another and to be found throughout the four corners of the world. But he says, the one who, who scattered them, who allowed the countries to come in and take them into exile and do all that's been done, and we see it all the way through, even the Spanish Inquisition, we see it all, all the different times you see the Jews cast out, cast out, cast out. Nobody wanted them. And they end up settling somewhere, and then they end up being absorbed in, and they don't go back home when things change. doesn't matter at this point now whether they liked where they were living in the past or whether they were hurting and, and wanting home. God's put it in them, and he's bringing them home, and he says, he will keep them as a shepherd keeps his flock. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We see in the trilogy of Psalm 22, 23, and 24, we see the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. This is the Lord in all three, but in chief shepherd, this is what I'm seeing. He is gathering them in, and he's going to keep his entire flock, and they will be saved. They will dwell in the pastures of Israel. They will have water. They will have green grass. They will not plant and have someone get their harvest. They will not build a home and have someone else live in it because they've been thrust out. The one who allowed the scattering in punishment and to awaken them, regathers them and says, I will be their shepherd. That shepherd is tender loving care taking care of every need of every sheep. He doesn't have sheep that he doesn't care about. He doesn't have sheep that he just, oh, well, I'll let that one go. No, he gathers them all one by one and cares for each one. This is the great love of our great God. Where else are they regathered from? I've told you several times from Babylon. Let me take you to Isaiah 11 because we see that there and yet it's not a word that you will recognize as Babylon. So let me explain it to you. Chapter 11 of Yeshia, Isaiah, and verse 11 says, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover with his hand the second time the remnant of his people who will remain. You know, he's brought them back once. He brought them up out of Egypt, but he's going to bring them back again, and this time it will be permanent. Where are they going to come from? Excuse me, verse 11 says from Assyria. We know that that's not Syria. That's Assyria, and that, that was the area um, north. It was the area swallowed up by Babylon. Um, I'm weak on saying that right, but I think we all know. Egypt, Pathros, Cush, this is Russian area, Elam, that's east of Israel, and then it says Shinar. Go a little further east, and the area of Shinar is Babylon. That's what the area was called in Bible times. Hamath, from the islands of the sea. What he again is saying, from all over, he's going to be bringing them back. 
And again, if that was Antichrist headquarters, I can only imagine that it's only miraculous that Jews were left in Babylon alive, that they survived during that time because they had to have been in deep hiding or he would have uh, annihilated them for sure. But, uh, but like we saw even in the Holocaust, sometimes right under the nose of the Nazis, the, the Jewish people were protected. God's hand of protection. They will be regathered to the land of Israel. I've been saying this, but let me give you scriptures. Yermia, Jeremiah chapter 33. I probably should have told you to keep a marker in both of these, but they're right next to each other, so it's not too hard. Jeremiah chapter 33, you, for your own later, if I don't read all of these verses, um, I'll give you the complete references. This one is verses 7 through 14. Starts out in 7, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel. When Israel was a divided kingdom, Judah was uh, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and Israel was the ten northern tribes. So it's referring to all of Israel, all 12 tribes. I will restore their fortunes. I will rebuild them as they were at the first. I will cleanse them from all their wrongdoing by which they have sinned against me. I will forgive all their wrongdoings by which they have sinned against me, revolted against me. It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of all the good that I do for them. And they'll be frightened and troubled because of all the good and all the peace that I make for them, for it, for Israel. What I'm bringing to your attention is we've never seen this on the face of the earth. We have never seen that they've all been brought in, that they've had their sins forgiven, their wrongdoings done away with, that they're, that his name is a name of praise and joy, joy and glory before all the nations of the earth. Even when Israel was doing right, it was a glimpse toward, but it was not the fulfillment of this. And why are the nations frightened and tremble? They realize, wow, this is a God to be obedient to. This is not a God who takes things lightly. He will inflict punishment where it's needed. And yet the good and the peace will be for all. Um, if we keep going, let's see. Uh, I think you can read the rest on your own, just that, that the cities and the streets that were deserted, were without inhabitants, now are inhabited again. That you have again the voice of joy and gladness, the groom, the bride. You know, life is going on again. Give thanks to the Lord of armies. I think that phrase is because the Lord of armies is the one who returned and set up the kingdom, and we are the armies that came with him. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. They're going to bring a Thanksgiving offering to the house of the Lord. We'll talk more about that in a bit also. Um, and it tells it that they're all, you know, coming um, again in this place, which is waste. At this time, it was a waste. It, it will be a pasture for shepherds. The city's on the hills. The, the negative's going to blossom. Um, the flocks, again, are going to be fulfilled. Isaiah 35 is a great picture, too, uh, of how beautiful Israel will be when God restores. But I'll let you read those verses on your own. Go with me to Ezekiel, Hezekiel, chapter 34. Does Rowena have a question? Does Rowena have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rowena. Okay, um, just clarifying. Mm -hmm. Because when you're saying that God has this tug in the heart of the Jews to come back to the land, and then we are reading verses that God will forgive them their sins, cleanse them from their iniquity. So is this time after the Great Tribulation? Because even right now, there's a tag in the heart of the Jews to come back to the land, but we are not yet in tribulation. Right, right. So the tagging of the heart has started now, and I think it will only increase. And you have the unsaved Jew... And I'm not saying it's 100% because there are those that are not, you know, not responding at all to the tug of the Lord. But even among unsaved, they'll say, you know, I don't get what it is, but I, I've just got this draw toward Israel. I, I've just got something tugging at me. I want to go see the land or, or I'm thinking about moving there. And they wonder why. They don't know because they're not in that right relationship with God. They're not reading the scriptures to understand. But we see the start of that now. Now when they do, when they are brought home, the ones that the Lord is bringing home, we will see are those whose sins have been forgiven, who have uh, the Lord as their Messiah and he's bringing them into their full blessing now. So the heart tug can start whether they're saved or unsaved. The fulfilling of the heart tug in the Jews that are brought home is at the point when they have been, um, they've put their faith in the Lord for salvation and the tribulation has passed. 
and now he is bringing them into the land. He's got the fountain in the land. It says it'll flow from Jerusalem. And I'll show you that fountain, I believe what he's talking about is the river that flows from the throne of God. And he's symbolically speaking, but he's saying, we even sing that song. Um, oh, come on, Rochelle. The, 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 when we've been dipped in the blood, the fountain that flows. You know that hymn that I all of a sudden can't Washed do? In Washed in the blood. Maybe that's the name of it. Anyway, we, we don't literally see a fountain that's got blood and we go jump in it. But we know that what we're speaking about is that the Lord's blood was shed for us. It covers us. And that fountain that's going to flow from the throne of God in Jerusalem is represented by blood and by water. Water is a picture of the scriptures of the word of God, the water that regenerates, the water that refreshes, the water that renews, that we're renewed by the word of God. How are we renewed? By coming into right fellowship through the shed blood. So the forgiveness of sins only come when they put their faith in Jesus as Messiah. We're going to see, remember when Zechariah says that they look and they see the one that they've pierced and they'll say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I believe that they're either saved looking for that moment or they're right on the edge of salvation. They've been coming along and at this point as they see it, their heart cries out, yes, I believe, like the thief on the cross. It can be at that last moment that I believe a good number of them will have been coming, have come to faith also. When we get into the judgments that follow this, um, Israel regathered, we'll see who goes into the millennial kingdom because not everyone who lives out the tribulation is saved. I don't want to give that false idea either. There will be saved and there will be unsaved who live out to that last day and we'll see the judgment that affects both of those groups of people very, very shortly here. But that tag, especially for a believer, and especially at the time of the world tribulation, is going to be so strong to point them toward home. God's putting that in their heart. He's drawing them. The same way you put a bit in a horse's mouth and you draw them by the, the bit in their mouth, they want to go home. Why do mm. they want to go home? Because God's drawing them there. Mm -hmm. you know. People say this even now. Why do you want to go and live in Israel now? It's not safe. Well, number one, <laughs> it's not as unsafe as they're saying they don't understand. And you are safest in the middle of the Lord's will, wherever he calls you to be. If he tells you to be in Timbuktu, that's your safest place to be. If he tells you Israel, it's your safest place to be. If you're a Jew and he tells you for some reason to be in Russia... You're still safe there if you're in the center of his will till he wants to bring you home. But that tug that the Jew feels to go home to the land, to have that yearning for the land, I believe, is God-given to turn them in that direction. And even so that as they teach their children, they're pointing them in the direction where they'll hopefully learn of the God of Israel. You know, they should look at that nation and they should say, how did that happen? And that should begin them on the path to finding their Messiah and Savior. Yes, Rowena? It seems that um, I have the impression that God wants them to come home to claim what is theirs because that is their promise, right? Yes. Because we had BSF this morning and one of the lessons was Abraham told his servant, do not bring Isaac back to Mesopotamia to look for a bride. Right. Just bring the bride over. Right. So right. it just gives the impression that God wants the Jews to in claim their, what is theirs. In their land, yes, yes. He wants to fulfill the promises that he's given to them. He wants them to be in his holy mountain. He wants them to be in the place where he is dwelling with them in that way. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree, yes. He, he does, and it is because he is faithful to his word. When he called them to go into the promised land the first time, it wasn't an uninhabited land. He told them, there's seven nations that you're going to thrust out. These are people that are worse than your sins have been. These are people that are so bad. I'm going to thrust them out of this land that's flowing with milk and honey, and I'm going to bring you in, and I'm going to put my name on this place. This is going to be your home. He chose it for them, and yes, he wants to bring them home. He wants to bring them into the blessing. The same way if you had a prodigal child, and that child's out in the world getting beat up by the world, you want to tell them, come home where it's safe. Come home where I can feed you. 
I'll clothe you. I'll shelter you. I'll take care of your needs. That's, that's the relationship our God wants with his people. And he put it on Israel. He said, I'm putting my name on this piece of property. That's the difference is he chose it. He put his name on it and he established it. And yes, he wants to fulfill it. Absolutely. Did I see another hand? You're welcome. I gather I got all her question answered because I got the thumbs up. So, but yes, yes. Good to tie the two in together. We see the first time into the land. And remember, the conquest would make them stronger because as they did battle, they would learn about their Lord. They'd learn the victories in the Lord. It would make them stronger. It would draw them closer. He didn't take them the easy way. He took them roundabout because he, he had to prepare them and get them ready for the battles. And in those battles, they started out great. Jericho, Jericho, first battle. They won. And they didn't lift one sword. They didn't have to do one hand-to-hand -hand combat. The walls fell down. And the people were overrun. That's our God. Come on home, children of Israel. I want to be your father. I want you in your homeland. I want you safe. I want to bless you. And your blessing will go out worldwide. Okay. I thought I was seeing a question come, but it didn't go that way. So, back to Ezekiel 34. We'll start with verse 11 on your own. Read through verse 26. <clears throat> For the Lord God says this, here we go again, Behold, <laughs> I'm a broken record, but I want you to get it. I myself, God speaking, I myself will search for my sheep, look after them, as a shepherd cares for his flock on a day when he is among his scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and a gloomy day. It was a sad day in Israel's history when they were scattered. When 70 AD happened, the destruction of the temple, and they were scattered out of their land for, for the almost 2,000 years. God's calling that a, a gloomy day, a cloudy day. I will bring them out from the peoples, plural. Gather them from the countries, plural. Bring them to their own land. Feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams, in the inhabited places of the land. I'll feed them good pasture, grazing place. Sheep need grazing places. Feed them rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. No question where. I myself will feed my flock. I myself will lead them to rest. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick, that the fat and the strong will eliminate. Those are those who think that they are good without their God. Those will be fed with judgment. It goes on. I don't want to keep reading because you can on your own. But it tells how the Lord God would take care of them. He would save his flock. Verse 22. They will no longer be plunder. That's why I know this is future and not any time of Israel's history in the past. Because Israel has been plundered again. And again and again. But this time it will never happen again. And he will judge between one sheep and another. We're going to talk about that judgment in just a little bit. Then he tells us in 23 that he'll point over them a shepherd by the name of David, David. Remember, he had promised to raise up David. He will feed them, he himself, and be their shepherd. And the Lord will be their God. And his servant, David, will be prince among them. David, I believe, will be brought up um, to a high power in Jerusalem under the Lord but a high power again in Jerusalem. I will make a covenant of peace with them, eliminate harmful animals so they're safe. Um, the trees of the field will yield their fruit. I love middle verse 27. They will know I am the Lord when I've broken the bars of their yoke and have saved them from the hands of those who have enslaved them. It goes on and continues of how they won't be plundered. They won't plant and others gain other things that I've said before. And again, they're told they're the sheep of his pasture, and he is their God. Wonderful, wonderful verses. If we had all day, I'd love to just read every verse, but read it on your own and thrill to the fact that God keeps his word. He is faithful, and he is the greatest shepherd, the greatest protector. Ah, I could go on and on. Go to chapter 36. Let's look at verse 24 to 28. I guess that's verses 24 to 28 to chapter 36 starts and says, I'll take you from the nations, gather you from the lands. It sounds very much the same again. I just want you to see it in a number of places. 
bring you into your own land. Sprinkle clean water. You'll be clean. Cleanse you from your filthiness and your idols. Moreover, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now we know this is a, a heart that is right forever with the Lord. Israel has never gotten to that point where their heart has been right forever. They get right and then they forget their God and they're, they're good and they backslide and we go through this, but now it will never happen again. This is in conjunction with Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 that talks about the new covenant and says he would take out the hardest stone that was like it was for them when Moshe uh, brought them out of Egypt. And he put in the heart of flesh. What he's putting in is his spirit. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. Bring it about that you walk in my statutes and you're careful to follow my ordinances. How do you be obedient to God? By his spirit being put in them. That's how they're finally going to get it right is they'll have the spirit of God living in them. Remember Ezekiel 37, there's not the spirit of God living in them yet. Here it is, here it is, um, and multiplying again their fruits and, and the grains and everything. They'll remember their evil ways, and they'll realize that was not good in their wrongdoings, and then they, they will be in that right place with the Lord, and he says, verse 32, and get this. This is again what I tell you. It's not that he says the Jew is better than. He says, I'm not doing this for your sake. I let that be known to you, be ashamed and humiliated for your ways. He does it for his name's sake because he declared it. He said he would do it and he would do it unconditionally. So he is going to be faithful even where they weren't, but he'll bring them into a heart that will be faithful. Rhonda. Why am I thinking that this is when G when Jesus came and he laid down his life, the first Christians were Jewish people, and the Spirit was in them at that time. Why is it, why is it not that? And because that was true of individuals. Even in Yeshua Jesus' day, when he came the first time, there the, out of the number who believed was a small remnant in the number of all the Jewish people. You had your Pharisees, you had your Sadducees, they had their followers. You had the crowd crying out, crucify him. There were those who believed and those who followed, but they were the minority. God always keeps a remnant though. So yes, in Yeshua's first time on the earth, you see, you see some of those who turned their hearts to him. But as we go on, very, very short in time, you know, keep in mind, we're talking a whole timeline. We're talking 2,000 years since he was here. So when I tell you, if he was here and he did his ministry in the 30s, by 70 AD, Israel is so in rebellion to her God that he allows her to be scattered out of Jerusalem, out of her homeland, and allows her to be plundered. Titus comes in and he burns Jerusalem. He burns the, the temple walls down to get the gold that's in between to, to, um, to pull it out. What's the word? Um, separate it and pull it out. I can't think of the word. But uh, we see in a very short time, we see the first um, generation of believers that, yes, started with all Jewish believers. Many of them went to martyrs' and deaths. It wasn't that it caught on. I hate to ruin your picture, but let's take Pentecost, as you call it, Shavuot. 50 days, the Lord ascended into heaven. 40 days after his resurrection, 10 days later, the power of the Holy Spirit comes on them. We read right after that that about 3,000 got saved. Heard Peter's message, turned, and he was on fire. He went from the one who was scared to and denied his Lord to give him one of the best sermons you could give. And I mean, he goes through Jewish history and he just lays it on the line. He does great. It's Acts 2 and then another sermon in Acts 3. But you read that 3,000 came to believe in that day. And I'm thrilled for one who comes to believe. So don't get it wrong. 3,000 is great. But how many Jewish people were in Jerusalem at that time. This is one of the three major feasts that they were to go up to Jerusalem for. So from wherever they lived, they were to make this pilgrimage to um, Jerusalem. Now granted, not every Jew did. That was supposed to because some were so far out they weren't doing it at all. But even out of all who did, they estimate that there were over a half a million Jewish people in Jerusalem. 
when you've got a half a million and 3,000 get saved. That's just a drop in the bucket. I wish it was, you know, almost the whole half a million that got saved. So I wish there were more hearts that turned. God always keeps in remnant. There's always some who turn. But even in this day, and, and if you keep reading and you realize when he says uh, key words for us to know that this is future is when he says it'll be forever, that they'll never be cast out again. Well, he couldn't say that to the first generation Jewish believers because most of them were scattered or killed. Any Jew found in Jerusalem after 70 AD was a dead Jew. So, you know, it, it did not happen. It was not fulfilled. And the majority of them were not recognizing their evil ways and confessing them to the Lord and humbling themselves before him as Messiah. Remember, the, the majority of the nation turned away from Messiah because they thought Messiah should come ruling, he should break the power of Rome, he should set up his kingdom, that's how we'll know he's our Messiah, that's who we'll accept this one. This one who's caused an insurrection, this one who gets crucified, that can't be our Messiah. Our Messiah is stronger than that, more powerful than that. They did not understand. Their eyes were still blinded to the truth. It was only that small remnant that believed and that were saved. But we see out of that, God kept his, the, a few for himself. He always keeps that, that, that remnant that do believe. And we see, I lost my train of thought, we go from um, the few who believed at that time. I don't remember where I was going. Have I answered the question, Rhonda? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, um, so, yeah, we've got a, a sampling, but not a, a complete fulfillment until millennial reign. That's when they're never going to be kicked out of Israel again. They're never going to turn their back on their God again. We will see at the end of the millennium that Satan goes through and brings up a an insurrection against Messiah, but the true believer, the ones who, who truly had the Lord in their heart that entered into the millennial kingdom in that condition are not the ones that will follow Satan. And I will spell that out specifically as soon as we finish our millennial study and we're on that, that episode. It's called Gog and Magog. Anne? Oh, unmute yourself, Anne. Thank you. There you go. In these references that you've been giving to us, uh, Isaiah 12, Jeremiah 14, Ezekiel 36, 24. Um, well, I mean, Isaiah 11, 12, okay. Jeremiah okay. 33, 14. Okay. <laughs> Ezekiel 36, 24. Yes. Um, so specific to him returning, bringing his own back to Israel. What um, is going on with uh, the Gentiles at this time who believe in... I oh, no, this is the Old Testament, isn't it? I'm sorry. Right. At this time, any outside yeah. of Israel have, have uh, proselyted into Judaism and come under the law of Moshe also to show their obedience to the one true and living God. And they, of course, would be included. The temple always had that court for the Gentiles. So you know there were those who did come in, and they would be received in. As far as when we get into the tribulation, what about the Gentiles at the end of the tribulation? How does that fit in with millennium? Stay tuned. <laughs> that, that's the coming lesson, okay? <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Thanks. Wait long enough, we'll find out. What? Wait long enough, we'll find out. <laughs> Wait long enough, you'll find out. I'm trying to get there. I get wordy, but I hope I'm not so wordy that, you, I, that you're not sitting there saying, okay, you've said it, move on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to prove my point because uh, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. I want you to have enough scripture that you know how to understand the, the books and to um, put them together and to see that it, this isn't one person renegade. This isn't, oh, I've got an idea and I'm running with it. No, this is prophet after prophet after prophet that God foretold through. And when he says it again and again and again, and they all agree in their different times and different backgrounds, and they didn't know each other, they didn't get together in cahoots and say, let's all say this then you, you really begin to know, okay, this is solid. We can trust this. Excuse me. So that's why I'll take you to Amos now, Amos. 
This is a book we haven't touched for a while, chapter 9. And we'll look at verses 14 and 15. Amos, Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Again, God speaking, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. He's intending to bless them greatly. They will rebuild the desolated cities and live in them. And by the way, this did not happen after the resurrection of Messiah either. In that first generation where the question was being asked, well, what about, you know, weren't there Jewish believers then? Yes, there were. But did they have their fortunes restored? Did they get to rebuild the cities and live in them and not be kicked out again? No, we know what happened. Go to 70 AD. It's well documented in history. They'll plant vineyards and drink their wine, which means a vineyard grew up and they harvested it. They'll make gardens. They'll eat their fruit. We've got one little plant here that we plant that bulb, and we have to wait six to eight weeks to see the flower come out of it. Time passes. He's saying you're not going to be kicked out, and by the time the harvest comes, somebody else is going to get it. They will not be uprooted again from their land, which I have given them. How did they get it? God gave it to them. So those who want to argue and say, well, what right does Israel have? God's right. Okay? When you created the world, when you created the people who are in the world, you can put the people where you want also, and you can make the rules. But until then, I think God gets to. So argue with him if you've got a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 30 and verse 3. That's not chapter 33. That's chapter 30, verse 3. It says, For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall take possession of it. I think that sums it all up there, okay? Their, their fortunes are restored. The Lord's the one who brings them back. They will take possession of the land that he gave to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. That land that if you want the, the size of it, go to Genesis 15, 18, if I remember accurately, and I believe I do, that will give you the parameters of the Israel that God is talking about. A whole lot bigger than the little sliver on the map that she has now. Okay, so that's regathered to the land of Israel, delivered out of Russia. We've touched on this, but since we're in Jeremiah, just back up to chapter 23 and look at verses 5 through 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. Here's how you'll know what days he's talking about. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch. David's righteous branch, Samach, comes out of the loins of David. We are talking Messiah. When Messiah is, is raised up, the righteous Messiah, who will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. When Messiah sits on the throne, the only way it's going to be, the judgments will all be righteous and just and right. And it will happen in Israel, in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live securely. Israel's in the land now. She's not secure. No matter what she says, she knows she's got 22 Arab nations around her that most of them would like to swallow her up and push her into the sea. Now she will live there securely. And this is his name by which she'll be called. This king, this one who's ruling righteously and justly. If you have any doubt that I'm right or wrong, what's his name called in verse 6? The Lord our righteousness. That's it. Who else is the Lord our righteousness? There's no one else. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought the sons up out of Israel from the land of Egypt. But they'll say, as the Lord lives who brought up and led the descendants of the household of Israel back from the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them. Then they will live on their own soil. The north land, north of Israel, is Russia. So here he's saying specifically they're going to come back from Russia and they're going to come back from all the countries where he has driven them. We know that, that there are Jews in Russia today who cannot get out. I imagine that it will be they or their close descendants if we're as close to this timing as I believe we are. They're going to come back from every country where they've been held captive. Stay in Jeremiah. Just go to chapter 30. I think we were there. Sorry, but my points, you know, make us jump around a bit. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9 says, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. Remember I said David, David would be raised up again, whom I will raise up for them. 
Do not fear, Yaakov, Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord. Don't be dismayed, Israel, for behold, I'm going to save you from far away and your descendants from the land of their captivity. Jacob will return and be at peace without anxiety. No one will make him feel afraid, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you, for I will completely destroy all the nations where I've scattered you, only I will not destroy you completely, but I'll discipline you fairly and will by no means leave you unpunished. This is why we know it's future, because they've never seen a complete destruction of the nations that came up against them like they will see in the time to come. Will they be disciplined? Yes. They're going to be child trained. They're going to be brought back in. They're even being, you know, the Lord's child training now. It's just long suffering in his child training. He's not clobbering them, but he's trying to to warn them. And it's kind of like you give a child a time out and then you, you, you restrict them a little bit longer and then you take away another privilege. You, you begin to make it harsher so that they'll wake up since they didn't wake up to the easy correction. And he's basically saying, now, I'm going to discipline you fairly. Where you're out of line, you don't get away with it. It's not that I, that, that the um, Arab nations are the only ones, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say Arab, earthly nations are the ones that, that are going to feel the hand of God come against them. But where you're misbehaving, my hand will come down on you too because I do righteously. I do justly. So Israel needs to, to be corrected, and she will be corrected. All of us need that. We know that. Um, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 39. <clears throat> Ezekiel 39, and we'll read verses 25 to 29. Ezekiel um, 39, verse starting with verse 25. 39 and verse 25. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says. Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on all the house of Israel. I'll be jealous for my holy name. They will forget their disgrace and all the treachery which they perpetrated against me when they lived securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. Remember, they'd be in the land, they'd be doing well, they'd forget their God, and it finally resulted in going into captivity. When I bring them back, though, when that pattern is finally ended, I bring them back from the peoples, gather them from the lands of the enemies, then I shall show myself holy through them in the sight of many nations. Does the world see the Lord as holy and over his people in the nations around the world today? No, they're not seeing that. They're not seeing Israel uh, in that way, like they will see, verse 28, then they'll know I'm the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations. And then I gathered them again to their own land. I will leave none of them there any longer. I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. Yoel, Joel, I think it's chapter 3, but a lot of Joel speaks about God pouring out his spirit in the last days, that they would have visions and dreams. And this will... Uh, excel during the tribulation time, but we see the forerunner of this absolutely in effect today. But when the world will recognize and the world will say, wow, look at the God of Israel. Look how Israel's dwelling and being blessed in her land. That's what hasn't been seen. That's what make, makes us know this is future. Yes, Rhonda? Oh, no? Okay, you got a hand signal up. <laughs> Okay, all right, so we'll go on then. All of Israel will be gathered. God keeps his promise. He will bring them all home, and they will come to know him as their God, their shepherd. He will be with them. The Jewish people will, at this point, not to be afraid to identify themselves as Jewish. Go to Isaiah 44. Isaiah chapter 44, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 5. By the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, that's how this is done. This is what the Lord says, chapter 44, verse 2. He who made you, formed you from the, from the womb, who will help you? Don't fear, Jacob, my servant, Yeshua, whom I've chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. And here's, that's just picture sports. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, my blessing on your descendants. They'll spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I'm the Lord's, 
and that one will call on the name of Jacob. That's the God of Jacob is what he's saying. Another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will give himself Israel's name with honor. Right now, some people are afraid to say they're Jewish. They're afraid to take a stand for the Jewish people. And there are some Jews that don't even want to live in Israel because they fear the enemies that are there. That's why I say, yes, we see a, a prefiguring of that tug on the heart, but it's not fully there yet because we have the opposite also going on. But in this day, at this time, when they are dwelling there with the Lord on his throne, they're not going to be afraid to say, I'm Jewish. I belong to the Lord. They're going to be proud of it. They're going to turn people to their Lord. They're going to be doing what they were supposed to do, being a nation of priests that represent God to the world. And what a change that will be because I am sure at other times in our history when they have been being hunted down for no other reason than being Jewish, they have not felt the freedom to write it on their hand, to say it, to declare it, and to draw others to their God. That will be a beautiful change in scenery. This world needs that. They need to be directed to the Lord, the God of Israel. The time of the regathering, let's go ahead and look real quick, and we'll finish with this one. Joel, because I, I mentioned Yoel earlier, chapter 3, and we'll just read verses 1 and 2. The reason why I'm doing this verse is this is going to take us into our next subject matter, which is the judgments, which we've been hinting at we're going to get to that and on the heels of the judgments we will see then who is entering into the millennial kingdom and we'll talk about what the millennial kingdom will look like that uh, will be complete 100 percent fulfillment of scripture yoel joel chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2 and i love it here we go again broken record rochelle but for behold <laughs> god is declaring it again in those days at that time, the time that we're talking about, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations. I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, I can't say that. Anyway, then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. Key phrases. What we're looking at is... When the Lord comes to restore the fortunes of Judah, the, to bless Jerusalem, at that time, he is going to enter into judgment on behalf of Israel. He's going to enter into judgment against those nations that scattered the Jews, that took them and cast them out of the, the land and kept them from returning. And notice he's coming against those who have divided up my land. You hear about the two-state solution? I believe, at least in the tribulation, and I hope not before then, we will see Israel divided. And actually, I believe it to be more in the tribulation because I believe it will be done at the hand of the Antichrist and his cohorts. And they will be dividing the land, Daniel says, for his gain, for the, the Antichrist gain. He's going to do it for his purposes, not to help Israel, not to help the Palestinian people who are, are fighting for it, not to help make a true peace, a true shalom, but because he's working it like a chess player. I'll give them this pawn because I'm working this where I can pull up and I've got complete control. But they will divide that precious land. That breaks my heart, but it is what will happen. But God says those who do that to Israel, I'm going to judge them. So now that's what we're going to look at is a judgment. We know the judgment, especially in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, is part of Armageddon. We know that when he comes and he stops the war and says that he slays the enemies on the, the mountains of Israel, that that is the start of the judgment against the nations who come up against Israel. We will see individual judgment of unbelievers much later at the Great White Throne Judgment. That will not come until after the millennial reign after Gog and Magog, we'll see it come just before we, we jump into eternity future. But we see nations judged at this time, nations that will suffer consequences during the millennial time because of how they acted in relation to Israel. So even right here, it's telling, them, telling us that he will bring... Um, gather the nations that have come against Israel. So obviously that's Gentile nations, okay? 
Let me give you another place that shows that it's Gentile nations that are going to be judged. That's in Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. We'll go to Matthew. Oops, I didn't get my M in there. Matthew chapter 13. Okay, there we go. And we'll read verses 47 to 50. Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 47, we read, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Okay, we've started a parable. A parable is an object lesson for us. The kingdom of heaven, we know what the kingdom of heaven is. It's when we look at the kingdom of heaven, it's in heaven and God's sitting on his throne. We know the kingdom of heaven is going to come down to earth. But he's saying that this kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea. Okay, what does C stand for in prophecy, scriptures, in scripture? We have sea and land. The sea refers to, I see a mouth going, but I don't hear an answer. And go for it. I think you may have said it. It represents uh, people. Okay, and which people? We've got a specific, we've got the world divided into two groups. Specifically, when we talk about the sea and we talk about the land. Probably uh, Gentiles. Take your probably out and I'll give you an A. <laughs> <laughs> the sea is representative of the Gentile nations. The land is representative of Israel. Anytime the Bible refers to the land, the land, the land, he's talking about Israel. Remember the two beasts that come up, Revelation 13, one comes up out of the land, one comes up out of the sea. We saw the one that comes up out of the sea, out of the Gentile nations, is the Antichrist. He is the worst of them all, the greatest beast of them all. The one that comes up out of the land is a false prophet, his right-hand man. This one is Jewish. That's why he comes out of the land, because he's Jewish. That's why, and i got to say it again, because... I, I don't, it's not that I think I'm all right to everybody. It really isn't, but I, I'm studied in this, and I feel very confident when I say these things in this manner. And I heard somebody I respect again today, and they said that they're going to, the Jewish nation's going to look at the Antichrist and think it's their Messiah. No, 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 no. He is not <clears throat> Jewish. He will not be looked upon as a Messiah. They will think that he is a wonderful person like a Messiah when he brings that false peace and gets all their nations to have that peace with them. But it's going to be a false peace that lasts for just a very short period of time before, boom, he'll reveal who he really is. But he's of Arab descent. He is out of the area probably of Iraq, Iran, Syria, because Antiochus Epiphanes, a type of him in scripture, came out of that area. He is not going to be Jewish. He came up out of the sea. He's going to be Gentile. Israel has a beast come up out of the land. He's going to be the false prophet. Why do we call him prophet? Because Israel looks to the prophets to speak and to, to tell the future, to tell what God has to say, but this one is false. This one, they should have tried his words, tested that spirit, and said, this is a false prophet, away with him, but they don't. They're going to swallow the lie because they have the veil of blindness over their eyes and they're deceived. They're not in, in tune with their God to know. So we have the two. Very clearly separate in scripture. So back to Matthew 13. When the dragon was cast into the sea, it gathered fish of every kind from the Gentile nations. Okay? Um, I want to keep reading. It was filled. They pulled it up on the beach. They sat down and gathered the good fish in the containers. But the bad they threw away. Okay? Here's your explanation. <clears throat> So it will be at the end of the age. Now, i got to stop you right there and make sure you keep a Jewish mind, okay? Our scriptures are Jewish. It's in relation to Israel. That's why we don't read great long history of America in the Bible because it's what happens in relation to the country of Israel. And that's where God centered it all. It's all about Israel and all about Israel's Messiah pre and after his first time on this earth. When we see the end of the age. You think like the Jewish mind. Remember the Talmudim went to Yeshua. Tell us, what are the signs of the end of the age? When will you build your kingdom? 
when he's ready to ascend into heaven, because they've gone through the crucifixion, the resurrection now, they ask again, is it time now? Are you going to set up the kingdom now, Lord? This is their whole thought. Kingdom age, kingdom age, kingdom age. Why? Because it's been promised to them from way back that there's coming this time when Messiah will sit on his throne. David will sit on the throne. There will be peace in the land. They will flourish. They will not have enemies around them. They're anxious for that. They're hurting for it. These Talmudim had every right to ask the Lord because they're not seeing what they expect to see. Rome still got control over them, and they're trying to figure it out. But as soon as we read this, and keep Matthew in mind, this is a Jewish man writing to a Jewish audience. So when he says, um, and I lost it, verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age, the end of time when the millennial kingdom will be set up. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from the righteous. They will throw them into the furnace of fire, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When we see a furnace of fire weeping and gnashing of teeth, we know that's descriptive of hell. A place of suffering, a place of torment, that's where the unrighteous will go. So we have a time when the millennial age is, is going to start now. We have the end of the age as they've known it. The, these, uh, and I say last days, but the last days go all the way through the millennium to the final insurrection and to the great white throne judgment where we will see individually them cast into their eternity of suffering according to their deeds. This is looking forward to that time. So this is telling us that there will be a judgment in the Gentile nations, that there will be some Gentiles that are going to go into, what did it say, they're, 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 they were pulled up on the beach, Excuse me, it just says they were gathered in the containers here. Well, the container is that they're being gathered to go into the millennial kingdom on earth. The bad will be cast away. They will not go in. So we have a judgment of our Gentile nations during this time. Let me expound on that. Let me take you to chapter 25 in Matthew. And we're still sticking with Jewish Matthew, talking to Jewish Israel. Matthew 25, let's start right now with 31 to 46. This is called the sheep and goats judgment. Okay, now, it tells us the timing right away. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that means we're not talking the first coming of Messiah, we are talking his second coming. When he has come, put a stop to the battle of Armageddon, and he's setting up his kingdom, and he's come in all his glory. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. This is meaning on earth, because he's sitting on the throne on the right hand of the Father in heaven right now. So this is meaning on earth. Furthermore, to prove my point, verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So you have the Lord sitting on his throne, and he's saying the sheep go on his left, I'm sorry, on his right. <laughs> They're right. You can always know which way. The sheep on his right, the goats on his left. Okay? Um, I want to keep reading. Then the king will say, the king's the one sitting on the throne. He will say to those on the right, the right or the sheep, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Yeshua is saying, you are blessed of Jehovah God the Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God made this plan before he ever made the world. This is amazing. This is amazing grace. He had planned all along for Israel to be brought into her kingdom, and now it's finally happening. Then he's going to go on, he's going to tell them why they get to come in. And actually, I need to stand a little corrected from what I just said because I'm spinning too fast. It's true that that is the blessing for Israel, the nation, but remember we're talking about the Gentile judgment right now. So I've got to take you out of, uh, out of thinking of it as Jewish and bring you to, it's the Gentiles who he's talking to, okay? Sorry about that because I'll confuse you. So the king's telling them that the sheep are to go, they're on the right and they're to go into the kingdom, the goats are on the left, okay? Then he tells them why that they're getting to go in. He's talking to the sheep and he's saying, I was hungry. This is the, the king talking. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. 
I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous, notice they're righteous. They're right with God. That means their sins are forgiven. The righteous will answer him. Lord, King, Lord, when did we see you and go through the same thing, hungry and feed you, thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you stranger, invite you in, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers, and some have put in now, or sisters, brethren in general, of mine, you did it for me. Now, when we look at this king in his earthly throne, his earthly throneship, what's the word I want, kingship? I'm not sure what word I want, but when we see him talking earthly, talking to earthly people, and he's saying, when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. Who is he calling his brothers? Who did they do this for? Rowena said it. I saw her lips. The Jewish people. The Jewish people being hunted down in the tribulation, not having the mark, not being able to go into the market and buy, not being able to stay in their homes they've been cast out, not being able to take care of the, the basic necessities of life. They're going to be in hiding because they're being hunted down. And those who are righteous in the Lord, that means they are believers. They are going to put their lives on the line for these Jewish people. And they're going to help save them. We see a, a picture of the Holocaust. We see Corey Tim Boom's family, Gentile family, hide the Jews in their attic. And they knew if they got caught, they would go to the concentration camps, and they did. Corey's own sister died in that concentration camp. She was a righteous Gentile. She was right in her standing before God. She had his robe of righteousness on her, but she suffered the consequences of not going the way of the land that was in disobedience to God. And she would be one that the, the Lord would be saying, well, she died, so I can't use her for example. But the ones who make it through, who did what they could to help save the Jewish people, the only ones who are going to be, and I'll put this in quotes, full enough to do that, during the tribulation will be the believers. Nobody else is going to stick their neck out for the Jew. They're going to say, are you kidding me? You're persona non grata. Get away from me. I don't want what's coming on you to come on me and my people. So this is very clearly, he's talking about his Jewish brethren, his kinfolk that are being hunted down, needed protection. You Gentiles proved your faith by your actions, now are being rewarded you get to come into the blessings of Israel also. Beautiful of our Lord. Is that now? Is that not? Um, remember the 144,000 were sealed so they couldn't be hurt. We don't read that those who come to saving faith are sealed so they couldn't be hurt. So there will be many who will, and we know many who will end up even beheaded, but the ones who help them are going to be the believers and they're going to be um, rewarded here and going into the kingdom. I think I made it clear. I'm looking at my notes. Um, so he's speaking to the Gentiles. That's why when he says, you did it to my brethren, obviously he's talking to another group of people. If you're not Gentile, you're Jewish. Okay? Clear to everybody? Okay. Now, let's see that Israel also has judgment, because it's not just the Gentile nations. Israel also has judgment. Go with me to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 33 to 38. A lot of people think the Jews got it in because they're Jewish. Don't need to do anything else. You got it made. Not true. They have to come to salvation, the same as the Gentile. God does keep his hand on Israel to keep her from coming to full end, which means he keeps some who are always, always some who believe. Verse 33, as I live, declares the Lord God, with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I assuredly shall be king over you. That wrath is tribulation. 
um, consequences so because the wrath of God is poured out. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you were scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. We see him come back in that wrath and trample the vineyards, the, the blood gushing out from the enemies of Israel. I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. So he's bringing them through, but there's going to be a judgment with them also face to face. Just as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. Remember, he finally said to the unbelieving Jews who would not enter the land because of their disbelief, he said, okay, your carcasses are going to fall in the wilderness. He judged that generation. 20 and under by age, I mean, not, peop not numbers, but those who were 20 years old and younger were not... Um, judged by that judgment from God. When they grew up and this older generation had passed away, they got to go into the promised land. God judged that generation and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. He says, just as I enter judgment, I'll enter into judgment with you. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you from the rebels and those who revolt against me. There are Jews who revolt against God, sadly. I will bring them out of the land where they reside, but they will not enter the land of Israel. So you will know that I am the Lord. So the unbelieving Jews don't get a get out of jail free ticket. They don't get a shortcut. They're not okay just because they're Jewish. They're only okay if they come into the righteousness of their God through saving faith in the blood of Yeshua. So the Jewish people also will enter into a judgment they will see God or the Lord judge them face to face, just as he has judged before. Look at Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. This is another place where we see God judges his people. Verses 2 to 5, Malachi, Malachi, uh, the last book in your, um, what you call Old Testament. If you're in the complete Jewish Bible, it's a different order. Verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? This is the Lord's coming. Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. The refiner's fire, the fire burns out the dross. It gets rid of the, the defects so that the gold will be pure. Soap, we all know what soap does. If you're dirty, you need soap. <laughs> he will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, like the one who's putting the fire to that silver to bring the silver out. He will purify the sons of Levi. I don't think you get more Jewish than that. And refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. He purifies them so they can come to him and offer him a righteous gift, not a, a sinful gift. Um, how far do I want to read here? Verse through verse 5. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. There was a time when they were right before their God and making the sacrifices and bringing their offerings and things were right and well and good with them. And the Lord says that will come again. But, verse 5, then I will come near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. Sorcerers, they're... they're they're dabbling in, in witchcraft and the false gods, the adulterers against those who swear falsely, those who oppress the wage earner and his wages or the widow or the orphan. He's even going after those who just are not taking care of the widows and the orphans because they're not being obedient to God. If they're righteous before him, they're doing what he says to do. And he always told them they were to take care of the poor and the needy, the orphan and the widow. And when they didn't, God judged them for it. And he says again, those who turn away from the stranger, from justice, and do not fear me. See, they're the exact opposite of the ones we just read about, who in the tribulation, even though they were Gentiles, were taking care of those in need, were looking out for the orphan and for the widow and for those who were in distress. But those who don't fear the Lord, they will be judged. The Lord of armies will judge them, whether they be Gentile or whether they be Jewish. I think the point has been made clear. I should have told you, did we read it? Maybe we did. We did Matthew 13. That's going to say I have to take you back, but we did. Let's go back to Matthew, though, and look at Matthew 24. Remember this chapter? 
I think I've taken you to it so many times that you probably have verses memorized by heart just from us going over them. Do you remember how orderly Matthew 24 is? Do you remember how God's always in order? When he spells out in order, we can follow it in order. So we start out with that very Jewish question in verse 3. Yeshua is talking to his Talmudim on the Mount of Olives. It's just them. The crowds have been dismissed now. It's just them. And they say, when will these things be that you were telling them about? When will be the sign of your coming? When will be the end of the age? The sign of his coming? To rule and reign. To be Messiah as they expected. They're asking that Jewish question. And the rest of 24 proceeds to tell them the signs of the coming. And as we go in order, we come down, we see that there's birth pains in verse 8. We see there's many false prophets that are fooling many people in verse 11. We see that there are perilous times. We come to a very identifiable time. Verse 15, the abomination of desolation spoken up by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. We know that's when Antichrist puts his image in the temple, says, bow down to me, take my mark, or it's off with your head. Okay, so we know by verse 15, we're at the midpoint of the tribulation. So what's going to precede the return of the Lord as King Messiah on earth? The tribulation. Verse 15, we're in the midpoint. That tells them to flee. They need to hide for a little while. Then when we get down, and remember that's the, the believing Jewish people who are into their scriptures, who have learned and are looking for these signs, they'll be the ones who know to flee. When we come down to verse, start with verse 27, it tells us when the, the Lord comes, the Son of Man, he's going to be called, a messianic title they know well, that when he comes, it's going to be the lightning, like from the east flashes to the west. The whole world is going to see his coming. We know that's the end of the tribulation when it comes back and stops the battle of Armageddon. Where the corpses, the vultures will gather. We know from Revelation that the vultures are going to eat the flesh of off of so many dead corpses in the beginning of the millennium. The beginning of the millennium doesn't start with a perfect utopia on this earth. The earth will have to be cleansed from what it has suffered, the consequences of the tribulation that's been happening. Verse 29 saying immediately after, remember the, the consequences of these tribulation effects that we've been reading about. The sun's dark and the moon's not giving us light. The stars are falling. The heavens are shaken and the Son of Man appears. So we know that's at the end of the tribulation. He'll send forth his angels, verse 31, with a great trumpet blast and gather together his elect from the four winds. Didn't we study that? Didn't we just talk about the regathering? And we know that that comes right after he stops that battle of Armageddon. So following an order, we come into a couple of parables. We're going to skip the fig tree for right now. But basically the idea behind it is the warning that, that when you see the tree blossom, it's time that the Son of Man is going to come. What it's saying is, when you begin to see these signs, you know the time is coming. That's why we excite ourselves when we see things developing. We say to each other, the Lord must be coming soon. He must be coming soon. Look at we're seeing the signs. So right, so on target, do that. Now, keeping it in that timeline, we don't suddenly jump back to previous time. And remember, I took you through it. So that let me take you there again. It talks about a judgment that comes, that, that, that when the Son of Man comes, no one knows the day or the hour, verse 36. The Son of Man comes, verse 37, when it's like it was in the days of Noah. That means when the Son of Man returns to stop this battle, it is as bad on this earth as in the days of Noah. The days of Noah were so bad that only one family, one family, eight people, that was all on the face of this earth, and there were billions at that time, they estimate, only one family believed in the Lord. Now, if you've only got one family that believes in the Lord, can you imagine how much evil filled the face of this earth? Look at how bad it is, and we've got a whole lot more families that love the Lord still. Can you imagine it coming down to just your family? Nowhere else on the face of this earth is the Lord's name being praised. Is his commandments being held up? Are people following his instruction? It, I, can fall. I think it's bad now. 
I cannot imagine. But in that condition, the world that bad, the judgment comes, the Son of Man is returning, and here is, remember, in, just like it was in Noah's day, verse 38, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. How many of the people right now are acting like what we say as believers is hogwash? They're laughing at us, they're scoffing at us, and they're going on having a merry time. They are just carrying on with normal everyday life. They're, they're taking care of their physical needs, they're marrying, they're partying, they, they, they have no sense that a judgment is coming. They did not understand. Verse 39, till the flood came and took them all away. How did it take them away? It took them away in judgment. When the flood came, and it wiped away the masses of people. It wiped them away in judgment. It didn't bring them into a place that was heaven. It didn't bring them into the presence of the Lord and into a glorious place. They didn't deserve it. They didn't believe in God. They didn't turn to him. They didn't have their robe of righteousness. They were carried away in judgment. At the time of the coming of the Son of Man, it will also be a time of judgment. So here, at the end of the tribulation, at the judgment time, the Son of Man returns, verse 42, in the field, once taken in judgment. The other is left. Two women are grinding at the mill. One is taken away in judgment. The other is left. Where do the two that were left go? They're going to go into the Millennial Kingdom. They're the faithful ones that have made it through the tribulation and they're going to go into the kingdom. That's going to be their reward is kingdom blessings. Keeping in mind, that's the time we're talking about, verse 42 now. Therefore, be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Remember, they can know the tribulation period is seven years. But there's a scripture that tells us that the Lord stops short those days of tribulation that if he didn't, he didn't come back then, there'd be no man left alive to come back to. So it's not going to be exactly seven years. Let me give you a specific scenario. I'm going to put it today. January 20th, 2021, rapture occurs, tribulation starts. So January 20th, 2028, seven years later, son of man returns. No, that's what God's saying. It will be close to seven years, close enough that we refer to the tribulation time as seven years. So when it says the half of it is 42 months, it's 42 months. So if the rapture occurred on January 20th, 2021, I would tend to say in my mind, somewhere between January 1 and January 19, <laughs> and probably more like around the 10th, let's just go for the middle, that's when the Son of Man will return. They can get close, but they're not going to know the exact Day. They're not going to know the exact hour. They'll know the exact year because they can count the seven years. That's not going to be hard, but they won't know the exact day or hour. And then he gives this analogy. Be sure of this. If the head of the house knew what time of night the thief was coming, he'd be on the alert. He wouldn't have allowed the thief to break into the house. For this reason, you must be ready as well. The Lord's saying, don't wait for me to come back. I'm going to come back and surprise you. Be ready. Now, he's not talking to believers today. I've got to just drive that home, and I'm going to end on this point because I know I'm past time, and, and Rhonda's doggy's wanting to go because we know she knows how to read the clock. <laughs> and if you didn't hear that last week, just ignore that comment. But my point being, they, they are going to, if they knew, when this one was coming to do them harm, they would have protected their home. Well, in the same way, if these people living at this time in the tribulation think that they can put off, I'll get right with God later, or I'm busy to it myself, I'll take care of myself, whatever excuse they give, whatever reason, because remember, even in the midst of this, which we can't understand, they cry out in anger against God. They blaspheme him instead of saying, Lord, God, have mercy on us. Well, he's warning them. The Son of Man's going to come that same way, an hour when you don't think he will come. So if you think you can wait till the last minute and get yourself ready, it's not going to happen. When we go into the um, ten versions next week, we're going to see five of them, ten of them knew the Lord was going to come. Five of them were prepared and ready. Five of them worked. Suddenly the bridegroom came and they get left out of 
the, the feats that they wanted to go into because they weren't ready. There is a time when they've got to be ready, and that's what this is saying, that they must be ready. Um, as we go on, 45 says, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave? Whom? Oh, oh, oh. Just before I finish that, because I won't get into this till next week in, in its entirety, let me also point out, for the believer, the believer is not, the rapture for the believer is not the thief in the night. The Lord doesn't come to steal. A thief comes to steal. A thief comes and destroys. That's not what the Lord does. And go to 1 Thessalonians 5 on your own, and you will read that we are children of the day. We are not of the night. We are not looking for the thief in the night. We are looking for the rescue of our Savior in the day. For us, it is not waiting for the thief at night, okay, or being surprised by and being left behind by a thief at night. I'll give that better next week. If you didn't catch it fully, at least I've laid the groundwork. So, then verse 45, the one who is faithful and sensible, the, this slave, who his master is put in charge of the household to give them their food at the proper time, those who are looking over and to be taking care of others, blessed is that slave whose master finds them doing so when he comes. If the master suddenly shows up, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. What's the eyes? What, what, are, what are you trying to tell me? I've got Rhonda and Rowena both doing the same thing, and I'm not understanding. One of you unmute yourselves, please. <laughs> what are you doing? Can't see you. Can't see you. Oh. Can't see you. I went away. Okay, you can hear me, though, right? Can everyone hear me? No, they can hear you. They can't see you. Okay, you just can't see me. Roger's working on it. He's going to try to... Uh-oh. Hearing's gone. Naomi can hear me. <laughs> Rhonda can hear me. Okay. All right. I'm going to go on because we're fighting the clock right now, and I'm trying to tie it up. If, if he can get it corrected, you'll see me. Hopefully you will. Yeah, they see you now. See? They see me now? Yeah. Okay. He did it. Roger did. Well, I saw them all along. They didn't go away. No, but you were up in the corner now. Oh! <laughs> That's how much I pay attention. I am up there. Okay. Okay. Glad. Thank you, Roger. We're back. Okay. Truly, the, this one who the, the master comes and the, the slave was doing what he's supposed to be doing. Truly, I say to you, he'll put that slave in charge of all his possessions. If you're found faith, oh, get rid of me. I don't need to be big, Roger. If you, Thank you. Sorry, but I, that's distractive to me. Um, if you're faithful in, in a little, your master's going to give you more to be in charge of. But if the evil slave says in his heart, well, my master's not coming back for a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves, he's eating and drinking habitually with those who are drunk, then the master slave comes on a day that he doesn't expect, an hour when he doesn't know, and he will cut him, that bad slave, into assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the unsaved, again, going into hell because they thought they could get right, you know, oh, well, when I see the Lord come, then I'll get right. How many times have we heard, well, I'm going to do this and then I'll get right with the Lord. They want to sow their wild seeds first. They want to finish this. They want to take it out. Or, or I'm going to clean myself up first so I can present myself to God in a good place. No. And that's true for us at this age also because we never know when life will end. But at this point, it is talking about judgment for going into the kingdom. The master comes back. And if they have not proven themselves faithful already, it is too late. They can't suddenly change and, oh, oh I'm going to do it. No, it's too late. They have to be ready before the Messiah returns. The same way we as believe, well, I can't say we believers, but those who are going to go in the rapture have to be ready before he comes back. He comes back in rapture quickly, and we are gone in an instant. There's not time to say, I want to be saved. There's not time to say, I believe. There's not time at all. It's a sudden rapture, and those who aren't ready are left behind. When, when he comes to set up his kingdom, those who aren't ready to go into the kingdom will be left out of the kingdom. Yes, Naomi. You're still muted. I'm still not hearing you. Can you help Naomi? Sure, good. I asked her to unmute this about all. 
Okay, try it again. Okay. There we go. What? At this point in the tribulation, though, wouldn't they have already taken the mark of the beast? If we're that close to the end. Um, oh. <clears throat> the unbelievers definitely will have taken the mark. The ones who have pledged allegiance. Um, it's a good question for me to be thinking about over our next week. Um, I'm thinking, you know, there are those who uh, have come up to the age of responsibility during the seven-year time. Could we be talking about them? There, it sounds very much like they still have the a choice, and once they've taken the mark, there is no choice. So there right. must be there must be some who haven't bought into it, but they've not bought into allegiance to the Lord. Maybe they have lived in, a, you know, gone off into an area far enough away from, you know, they're, they're camped out somewhere that they haven't had to. I don't know, though, because it's talking about them being there where they can help others, and they're, they're showing. What the point of it is is to show each individual has to, um, is responsible for themselves, and they, they prove their faith by their actions. Even James says, you know, show me your faith by your, your words. I'll show you my faith by my actions. I think I said that wrong. I'll get my head straightened out before next week but I'm thinking you know remember we're in a parable so we can't take everything in a perfect fit we get an overall okay. picture because um, the unbeliever who has taken the mark there is no hope for them this does right. sound like the, like the Lord's still warning some you have a chance still to get ready so it would have to be some that have not taken that mark um, mm -hmm. They're going to be few and far in between, and I don't know how they're going to manage to be able to prove their faith helping others because they're going to be in a world of hurt. So I, I'm not sure I've got a full answer at this point. Um, but again, I'm in a parable. So it may be just the generality to get the point across. You need to be ready. The, the, um, the ruler, the master is going to return. You know, because there are the, those who scoff today and say, oh, you've always been saying that, and he hasn't returned yet. And if they scoff like that in, in the tribulation, haven't taken that mark, though, but scoff and say, well, I'll believe it when I see it, no, it'll be too late when they see it. Are children required to take the mark? At what age? I should say, are children. We, she's asked me, are children required to take the mark of the beast, and if so, at what age? We're not given that in Scripture. But the one thing I can tell you is God does not hold a child responsible for an adult decision. So somehow God will, I, I, I imagine the child, because the ones who have to take the mark are the ones who buy or sell. So I imagine it's the parent in the home that will have to be taking the mark. But I can't see that they're going to be taking little three-year-olds up there to be, you know, given the mark. And if that were true, I think the Lord would somehow protect them from the taking of the mark. So probably the mark is going to be on those of workable age or something along in that line. And the children, just like um, we saw with David, you know, his son died very shortly after being born. But he knew his son was ushered into the presence of his God. The son didn't go into um, hell because he hadn't grown up and invited the Lord into his heart. He was covered under the blood. So uh, I'm sure that the children in the tribulation period also, the ones that are too young that are not making that decision themselves, are protected under the blood. What age is that? It's different for everyone. Some are able to judge things at a young age. Some are don't have that ability and that grasp to be, be making a rejection of the Lord until an older age. So God alone is a fair God and a just God, and I do not see him um, judging children and holding them responsible for something adult or forced on them in some way. So You know, a lot of children will follow the parents' footsteps and do whatever they right. do. Because right. it's apparent they don't know what they're doing. Right, exactly. I think of, um, and I, I could be wrong, but on the basis of David, I don't believe so. I look at times of Israel's history when they would go in and they were told to, to kill everyone. 
man, woman, child, they were all to be killed. And people said how horrible, how wrong that was to, to kill the children. But I believe that those children that were killed had not come up to an age of responsibility. So they were ushered into Abraham's bosom. They were, they do gain out of their, I don't want to call it naivety, but their um, innocence. In their innocence, they're not judged against them. You know, so this was even God's way of bringing them into his presence, which they maybe wouldn't have gotten if they grew up because they would have been indoctrinated by their parents and gone the way of their parents. But before they came to that age, they were spared that judgment. So in the same way they were spared, I believe, in the tribulation, children are going to be spared also from the judgment because they didn't themselves allege, <coughs> alleged, give their allegiance to, you know. I mean, you, you have little ones that are just mimicking mom and dad, doing exactly what mom and dad does, but that doesn't mean that they've understood and made a heart decision and said, I don't want to follow God, I want to follow this one, I'm going to make this one my God. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying, that, that God's not going to judge them for that. Right. That's like, sorry. Go ahead. That's like the Palestinian children. Uh, they're being indoctrinated at a young age, carrying rifles, they see them on TV, yeah. and gun, whatever they carry, and yeah. they're shouting death to Jew, but they don't really know what it means. Right, yeah. right. Two-year-olds, four-year-olds. I've seen them so small and so young that their rifle's taller than they are. <clears throat> They've just barely got it off the ground and, and it's above their head. And they're marching and, and crying out, death to Israel, you know, death to the Jew. And if that child is blown up in a bomb, I don't believe that that child goes into hell because that child wasn't old enough to decide, I'm rejecting Messiah. I'm like, rejecting the Savior. Like so. It's an argument out of silence, but we've got a very fair God who is judge. We've got a God who loves, who is not willing that any should perish. So, you know, um, some people have said, and here's the other side of it too, so many children die of starvation in these foreign countries, and these third world countries. And someone once said, how could God allow that starvation? Well, it better that they starve as children and go into the presence of the Lord than that they had a full stomach, grew up, rejected the Lord, and go into hell forever. So, trust it to God. Trust it to God. I'll work and see if I get a better answer on your question, Naomi. Um, if you get some insight, let me know too. Uh, but I definitely believe it, it's the point of it is to prove the individual's responsibility, that they've got to be ready before Messiah comes back at the end of the tribulation the same way we to go in the rapture have to be ready before the rapture okay we're okay. past time we're past time because of the question I'll pick it back up here in Matthew 24 um, I can say a couple more notes I see that I didn't quite say that I'll bring it up and we'll see what we say we'll look at Matthew 25 at the ten virgins um, we'll see that's a Jewish judgment but we'll look at that and we'll go on, we'll look at, um, what else do we look at? The judgment on Egypt, and then before we know it, well, maybe not before we know it the way I go, <laughs> but then we'll be into what the millennium looks like. But it'll take us a little bit of time, depending on how detailed you want the virgins, I can hit highlights, and we can zoom right through, or I can do verse by verse. That's something you might send me in a text, those of you who are still there who haven't gone away. Um, if you want detailed, it'll slow us down a little bit. But if you're hungry for that, then I can do verse by verse through that. If you want just me to bring out the highlights, the main points, I can do it that way. So give me a little feedback, and we'll see where we go, okay? Yeah, can we um, see the map, the first the map that was promised by God of Israel, and then the map of Israel now, and the map of Israel in the Millennial Kingdom? The Millennial Kingdom, I believe, will show the map of Genesis 15, what was promised okay. originally. So yeah. those two are the same. Um, I'll think, see if I can find in my all my maps, I'll see if I can find one that shows... Um, we find? we read it and it gives us a border so I can show you a map of today and show you from where to where and there's a little bit of um, um, 
some say it means this, some say it means that, but it still gives us a, a very good general idea. I can show you that. How I'm going to do that on Zoom, I will ask Roger to help me with that. Yeah, whiteboard right here on the screen. Oh. And I can put it up there. I put it in the picture here. Okay, we can, we can tack it on the whiteboard because I can't draw it. No, it, it, that's the whiteboard. Okay. I can put it on there, the whiteboard of the picture, or I can bring the whole picture up and put it up there for the whole okay. screen. Okay, so you all see that whiteboard right now? No, I'm not sure. Let me just look. Okay, do you see it now? Yeah. Okay. You see Roger scribble? Yes. Okay. Okay. He's telling me I can put a map up that he yeah. can show like that. So, okay. Yeah. So, map. No, because earlier when you said Israel will be divided, I was already thinking, isn't the land already divided? Because Israel is just occupying a very small space now. It is, but the land they call Israel will also be divided again. So, yes, they already cut Nisro's pie and just gave her a sliver, and then they're going to come along and say, we want half of that back. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean exactly half, I'm using that as an analogy. And they're going to slice it off again. So, sadly, sadly, because with the armory of today, the weaponry, it will make Israel so much more vulnerable. And, of course, that's their point. They don't really want a piece. They want all of it. They want the whole piece. So, but they will, I believe, what I believe will happen, and we've talked about it before, is I believe that uh, the Antichrist will give the Jewish people the Temple Mount and their ability to build the temple there, and maybe say in exchange for that, you know, we're making nice with you, you get to do your worship. Now, let's give those poor Palestinian people a little bit of land. You know, they want this land here in the West Bank or, you know, wherever it is. And because we're showing you how we can live side by side in peace, they'll go for it. But his intent in it is to be able to take control of the whole thing, you know, to divide and conquer. So, any other questions, comments? I think I lost some of my audience. It is late. I apologize for that. I think Rhonda had to go let her dog out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no more comments, questions? Okay, let's just close in prayer, and then we can open up the mics as a whole. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to your word. Thank you that it is orderly. Thank you that we have nothing to fear and everything to trust, that our God is coming back for us. We will be rescued in rapture. And thank you that Israel will never be brought to an end. You will fulfill your promises to her also. This, again, shows us how faithful you are to us, too. And for this, Lord, the fact we can always trust you no matter what's happening. We praise you and we thank you. And may we please you by having a heart of belief and not unbelief. In your precious and holy name, blessings on all. Keep them safe through another week. If we don't get home first, Lord, bring us back together next week for more study in your word. In Jesus' name.